Hello, Ben. Raja, Hello. Raja, I'll join in again a bit late. Okay, no problem. Okay, I have some work, so maybe after twenty twenty five minutes I'll join in. Is that okay? Okay, fine. No problem. Okay, okay, okay. Hello. Hey Ben, how are you? Everything uh, fine? Um, just back from the Tashkan, uh, Tashkan uh, trip. Hi Ben. Hello. Hi Ben. I'll come back. Nice to see you again. Hi. Yeah, see Good. you again. I'll see you in maybe half an hour. Okay. Sure, sure. Take your time. Take your time. Yeah. Yeah. So when you came back only today? No, no. I came back um uh one week, okay. and then one week uh, before. And uh, start working immediately after the after the after the Tescan uh Tescan trip. It was a uh, it was a really a uh, I I I think it was a really a um, great event to the local neurosurgeons and uh, even nice. I have shared a a, um, a Facebook post that even local TV is uh, interviewing the uh, uh, professor uh, Gary F. Uh, in this event that's nice professor kim kilsu has joined us hello sensei professor kim, hello oh, hello how are you all right <laughs> fine thank you most welcome uh, yeah so would you like to check your powerpoint professor okay please Can you make it full screen, please? Okay. Okay. No issues. Working well. Thanks. Are there any videos you would like to check? Okay. Yeah. Now, are there any videos in the PowerPoint that you would like to check? Excuse me? Are there any video files inside the presentation? Okay. You can go directly to that slide if you want so that we can check. Hello, Liu. Welcome. Hello, Liu. Hi, hi, Raja. Hi. So, Kilsu Sensei, you work with uh, Horisawa Sensei? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we all know Horisawa Sensei because he is a very frequent participant in our webinars. I don't know why I'm expert speaker. Maybe I'm young neurosurgeon speaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not yeah. so well, we are great uh, well, I will do my best thank you for Most inviting Professor Kato has joined us hello sensei Kumbawa Kumbawa Kim sensei Kumbawa 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 Arigatou gozaimasu o hisashimi desu o genki desu ka いや、あの、若手枠だと思ったらなんかエキスパートスピーカーでちょっと緊張してます。何何いや、若手。Maybe I'm young neurosurgeon but you you may uh, you are the youngest I think. Maybe the Ben is the youngest I think. Yeah, I think I'm the youngest. Ben is the youngest. So you Hopefully. need grass, uh, Dr. Raja. Yeah, I just uh, finally got, got finally. one. Finally, <laughs> finally, finally. <laughs> age, age is catching up, I think. <laughs> Almost the same yes, uh, period of hours. Uh, Hello, Professor Anu Thomas. Welcome. Professor Anu Thomas is a leading neurosurgeon here in this part of the world. Welcome, sir. Uh, welcome, Dr. Raja. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for joining today. Okay. So today's hope, we have our president, Professor Yoko Kato here, and uh, we have our expert speaker, Professor Kilsu, and uh, Dr. Ben, who is the host for today's webinar. 
So has Dr. Ajit already joined? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I think he's in the in the audience. Uh, but uh, what is his uh, name? Like, is it a Zoom user? Who is this your Zoom user? Is it Enius or the Zoom? I am not sure about the Zoom user, but he's raising his hand. Okay, let's try it from out here. Hello, Zoom user. Can you please identify yourselves? Hello. Hello, Hello. sir. I'm. Oh. Well, you are Dr. Ajit, right? Okay, so he is the YNS speaker for today. Dr. Ajit, welcome. Thank you very much yes. for the opportunity, sir. Most welcome. So this is Basant. Mothani Sensei was here. Sensei, Basant Sensei. Konnichiwa, minasan. Kim Sensei, konnichiwa. Hello, Kim. Dr. Kim. Nice to see you again. Domo. No more. No more. So we have other audience also in Annapurna. Audio. That's great. That's great. Uh, in our audience, there will be more. Yoko Kato Sensei, how are you? Hi, konbawa, konbawa. Konbawa. Kato Sensei, arigatou gozaimasu. So you are in the Annapurna Hospital? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's became very beautiful, the white, bigger. Congratulations. Yeah. It's, it's getting bigger, the team is getting bigger. Yes, yes. Yeah. Who are they? Yeah. The next to you. This is a resident. A resident? Uh, yeah. Neurosurgical resident? Neurosurgical. Neurosurgical. Hi, namaste. Nice to meet you, ma'am. Hi, Japan is uh, 7 p.m. now. Konbawa. 7 p.m. Sensei, Konbawa. Please unmute your mic, Professor Otani. Can you please unmute your mic? Okay, okay. Okay, fine. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yes. Yoroshiku, yoroshiku yes. 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 Uh, PTT surgery just now. I'm coming oh, down oh. from the operation theater. Really? The second just case? did one PTT for uh, dystonia. Yeah. <laughs> so How your lecture will be. Uh, pardon? How was it going? The How patient was it? Good? Uh, it went very well. He is very happy. Already. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Again, shall we start, please? Yes. yes. Uh, so, uh, Roger and Professor Kato, so uh, shall I start uh, yes. uh, today's finest uh, webinar? Sure. So, um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all the audience and to the uh, ACNS finest uh, webinar today. So, uh, thank you all of you for joining uh, this uh, event. So, uh, today uh, our chair will be uh, Professor Pascal Pan, who is the chairman of uh, Annapurna uh, Neurological Institute in uh, Nepal. So we have uh, three uh, expert, uh, three uh, two extra speakers, and also one minor speaker. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Kyusu Kim, who will be talking about how to treat dystonia patients using PTT and a real phalomotomy. Whereas uh, our minor speaker, uh, Dr. Ajit Kuma, who will talk about the role of dynamic DSA in the evaluation and management of bow hunters syndrome. And also our expert speaker, Professor Naoki Otani, uh, who, is, uh, who will be talking about a surgical treatment strategy for Gaoma in the Nihon University Hospital. Our discussion today will be uh, Professor uh, Ahiba and also uh, Professor Raja and also uh, Professor Andrew Thomas. So may I uh, invite our speaker, uh, our chair, Professor uh, Baskin Pan, to uh, introduce our speakers. Thank you, Professor Pan. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for this opportunity again. And uh, today uh, we have 
a young and very energetic Dr. Kim Kilsun from uh, Tokyo Women's Medical uh, College. And uh, he was with uh, us in our institute a uh, few weeks back. Uh, and he is a very, very energetic functional neurosurgeon. And uh, he is today talking about PTT, a pallidothalamic tract lesioning uh, on uh, Parkinson's disease and dystonia. So uh, PTT is a, a new target that has been you know, promoted by Professor Tyra and uh, then subsequently by his team. And uh, now uh, I think in, um, in the Tokyo Women's College, they are doing more of a PTT than GPI or other, other lesioning. And uh, recently we also converted our targets from GPI to PTT. And uh, we have got extremely good result on this. <coughs> and because this is a common pathway uh, to the thalamus. And um, so I will, we will hear about the experience of uh, Dr. Kim and his team. Uh, so please, Dr. Kim. Please share the screen. Okay. Thank you for introduction, <clears throat> Professor Panto. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Please make yes, it first. Okay. Okay. Yes. So today's my topic is how to treat dystonia patients using PTP and biothalamotomy. It is a great honor to be able to speak to you today. Today. I like to talk about the treatment of dystonia. So what is functional neurosurgery and what is dystonia? These are typical disease and treatment of functional neurosurgery. Dystonia, essential tremor, spasticity, and radio frequency ablation, deep brain stimulation. But in fact, not even neurosurgeons understand exactly what functional neurosurgery. So patients with dystonia are often told it was mental or there's nothing wrong with their brain. Most of them also don't know that surgical treatment was available. The epidemiology of dystonia is 60 in 100,000 people which is not small, but patients do not visit hospitals that cannot offer treatment options. So what is dystonia? Dystonia is characterized by sustained or intermittent involuntary muscle contractions causing abnormal movement, posture, or both. So, I will present some cases. Patient had left rotation and right lateral cortis and difficult turning light due to muscle tension to the left side. He was diagnosed with cervical dystonia. This female patient was diagnosed with tardive dystonia caused by the use of dopaminergic receptor antagonists. Tardive dystonia is characterized by involuntary muscle contractions and presents as abnormal posturing of voluntary muscles. And this is Meiji syndrome, a focal dystonic movement disorder involving gripper spasm or involuntary eyelid spasm and oromandibular dystonia. This is focal dystonia. She can't open her right hand because of muscle tension. So how can we diagnose dystonia? 
diagnosis of dystonia is based on clinical grounds and is therefore open to bias. To provide practical guidance for clinicians with less expertise in dystonia, a group of Italian movement disorder experts formulated clinical diagnostic recommendation for cervical and limb dystonia. This is result. Pattern and repetitive movements are the most important symptom when diagnosing dystonia followed by sensory trick. This is sensory trick. This patient had left rotation and difficulty turning light due to muscle tension to the left side, but he could easily turn his head by putting his hand on his cheek like this. As you see, sensory tree is useful for diagnosis, but in clinical practice, it is often not recognized in patients with dystonia. So what causes dystonia? The concept of dystonia has dramatically changed from being considered a psychiatric dystonia to a pure vessel ganglia disorder to finally reach the definition of a network disorder involving the vessel ganglia, cerebellum, thalamus, and sensory motor cortex. But we don't know still the exact cause. There are two circuits associated with movement disorder. Pyridal circuit associated, associated with dystonia and cerebral circuit associated with tremor. In general, globus pyridus internus, GPI, and thalamic ventral oralis complex nucleus, VO, are treatment target of dystonia. This one and this one. This is old paper written by Tesker. He, he already described that salamotomy is effective in the relief of distal, distal but not proximal dystonia. So he had noticed that salamotomy is effective for hand and foot dystonia. And the other paper, old paper also described about this. Applicability of salamotomy for focal distal dystonia and pyridotomy for axial, proximal, and generalized dystonia. Based, uh, based on this, we usually target VO for distal limb dystonia and GPI for, for proximal dystonia. Dystonia has various treatment options, radio frequency ablation, deep brain stimulation, focused ultrasound, and radiation. But in Japan, insurance still only covers essential tremor. So we cannot use focused ultrasound for dystonia yet. Deep brain stimulation is most standard surgical treatment for dystonia. GPI DBS has highest evidence, good indication for generalized dystonia and segmental dystonia. Insert the lip toward the target. Implant a pulse generator, pulse generator in the chest and simulate the target. Radio frequency ablation is treatment to coagulate the target. Insert the coagulating electrode toward the target, stimulate and check there is no side effect, then coagulate the target. Target located, located, a target location in, is the same both RF and DBS. So which treatment option is better? Bilateral GPI DBS has been reported 50 to 60% improvement, improvement of twisters. Twister is the score of cervical dystonia. In our institution, 56, 0.2% improvement of twisters. 
And this is our paper, Unilateral Pallidotomy in the Treatment of Cervical Dystonia. Unilateral Pallidotomy showed, showed 48% improvement of twisters. So effectiveness is almost equal. DBS is costly and requires regular outpatient follow-up, and the probability of infection is high. It looks like RF is a better option, but in the case of RF, complications are non-reversible and cannot be treated bilaterally simultaneously due to high rate of complications. If bilateral surgery is required, there must be at least six months between surgery to avoid complication. So it depends on the patient. We also performed bilateral pallidotomy and reported bilateral pallidotomy is more effective than unilateral pallidotomy for proximal symptom dystonia patient like this. But there is one problem. Bilateral pallidotomy increases the probability of developing Parkinsonism like this, increase from 4% to 20%. These are the Parkinsonism we have experienced after bilateral pallidotomy. This is case of freezing of gait. This is before pallidotomy and this is after pallidotomy. And this one is also case of freezing of gait. After bilateral pallidotomy, he had difficulty to walking like this. Sometimes it becomes a very serious condition and significantly reduce quality of life. <laughs> this is mycographia and this is postural reflex disturbance. These are also adverse effects of bilateral pallidotomy. So we reported bilateral pallidotomy cannot be recommended due to unacceptably high complication rates. Therefore, we had to consider new targets on the opposite side. That is pyridoceramic tract, PTT. The PTT comprises, comprises two fiber bundles, the ansa lenticularis and the lenticular fasciculus, which connect the GPI with the ventral anterior and ventral lateral portion of the thalamus. Targeting intervention at this point seems reasonable and efficient in, the, in interrupting pyridal afferents to the thalamus. So we perform unilateral pyridotomy with contralateral pyridotomy tractomy and reported about this. This is result of bilateral pyridotomy and this is result of unilateral PTT and contralateral GPI. BFMDRS, this is the score of dystonia. We reported that the same effect could be achieved with milder compl complication by unilateral PTT with contralateral GPI. So, Next challenge is pallidoceramic tractomy as a first surgical target for cervical dystonia. My answer is yes. We performed unilateral pallidoceramic tractomy for cervical dystonia. It showed 46% improvement of twisters. The rate of improvement is almost the same as the rate of improvement of unilateral pallidotomy that I mentioned earlier. But be careful, 
There is also possibility of adverse events when you perform PTT. For example, reduced hand dexterity and amnesia. How, so how to target PTT? Please recall this figure. As you see, PTT is immediately next to bamylosalamic tract and superior to the subthalamic nucleus. Both structures were clearly visualized as low intensity on tits like this. This is mammalosalamic tract and this is subthalamic nucleus. So you can find location of PTT easily by this structure. When you perform PTT, we set two stereotactic targets to cover the paridothalamic tract like this. This is in direct planning PTT. In our experience, first target is eight to 10 millimeter lateral, three millimeter inferior, zero to one millimeter posterior to the midline point of ACPC. The second target is three millimeter lateral, two millimeter superior, one millimeter posterior to the first target. So let me show the case of PTT. The case one is 29 year old man who was diagnosed with pineal tumor. After tumor removal and radiation therapy, involuntary movement in the neck and trunk appeared. We performed left GPI pyridotomy and staged light PTT. This is post left GPI pyridotomy MRI, and this is post right PTT MRI. As you see, because of tumor, posterior commissure is missing and it complicates the target plan. But in case of PTT, there is subceramic nucleus, which is inferior boundary, and mammalosalamic tract, which is medial boundary. They help us to determine target. Before the surgery, he had neck rotation, lateral coralis, lateral coralis, and neck myoclonic movement like this. We perform left GPI pyridotomy first, and then perform staged right pariosalamic tractomy. Post light pariosalamic tractomy, the, the symptoms mostly improve after surgery like this. The case two is truncal dystonia. She had involuntary movement of trunk and left hand tremor. So we perform light PTT and light VIM first and staged left GPI pyridotomy. After surgery, symptoms completely improve like this. We also tried bilateral PTT DBS for tardive dystonia patients. He had involuntary movement of the head. And after PTT DBS, the symptoms mostly improve. This is one day after surgery, and this is one month after surgery. The symptoms mostly improve like this. So next, to next topic is VO salamotomy for distal limb dystonia. Let me show the musician's dystonia first. Sorry. He 
is guitarist Detroit playing due to stiffness in the right wrist. And then symptoms improve immediately after salamotomy, like this. And she is saxophonist, difficulty playing due to stiffness in middle finger of the right hand. And symptoms improve immediately after salamotomy, like this. And his hair, direct, hair dresser departs using scissors due to stiffness in the right hand. And symptoms improve immediately after salamotomy. He is a drummer, difficulty playing due to stiffness in the left wrist. Symptoms improve immediately after salamotomy. So, and this is a case of focal dystonia of the right upper extremity. He had stiffness in the right forearm and wrist. Symptoms improve immediately after salamotomy. During operation, first, we check for symptoms and then simulate the target to confirm that there is improvement in symptoms and that there are no complications and then coagulate the target like this. This is post-operative MRI. The blue one is salamus, and the red one is internal capture, and the yellow one is uh, GPI. The pink one is VIM, and VIM4 is the VO. This is coagulation reason. This is lighter scramp. Lighter scramper characterized by abnormal posturing and movement of the hand or forearm during test case, requiring, requiring skilled hand use such as writing. This is pre-operative and this is for post-operative movie. This is task specific dystonia. The symptoms are stiffness of right second to fifth finger when typing like this. After salamotomy, VO salamotomy, symptoms improve, improved completely. This is post-operative MRI. So we reported about patients with task-specific focal hand dystonia underwent unilateral ventral salamotomy, VO salamotomy. Etiologists included, included 92 lighter scramper clamp and 58 musician dystonia 
and 21 other occupational test-related dystonia. Non-responder is only uh, 2% and more than 80% is a good responder. Permanent other adverse events are 3.5%. And so ventral salamotomy is a feasible and reasonable treatment for patient, patient with refractory test specific overhand dystonia. So my concrete conclusion is PTT and VO salamotomy are useful treatment options for dystonia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Kim. Uh, may I uh, shall I invite uh, Professor uh, Pen for your uh, uh, comment and also uh, our uh, later on followed by our uh, discussion for the comments for this uh, lecture. Thank you, Professor Pen. Uh, please uh, unmute uh, your mic. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim, for explaining to us about the importance of a PTT, pallidothalamic tract uh, DBS, and mainly you talked about lesioning. And uh, you also gave us some reasons why you shifted from uh, GPI to PTT, because it's a common pathway to the thalamus. So you are trying to um, make lesion not on the nucleus, but on the track uh, so that you cover the whole of the GP, uh, GPI and also part of the thalamus on that track. And uh, uh, you also talked about uh, if there is a severe dystonia, uh, then uh, you can even do a you know, PTT on one side and uh, GPI in another side, so that we avoid severe complications like dysphagia, swallowing difficulties. Now, uh, you, I have heard that you also have started doing uh, PTT lesioning in your center. Uh, mainly Professor Horisawa is doing, uh, uh, using PTT also for other indications. So if you could talk about uh, other indications also, you know, just name out the uh, surgery that you have just started. Okay. So the nearby uh, PTD, PTT, pallidothalamic tract, there is many fib uh, fiber, in nearby uh, PTT, for example, uh, associate with uh, OCD. OCD. Sorry, I don't the the full name of OCD. This that is a uh, psychic psychiatric uh, disorder. Uh, wash hand twenty times or five fifty times and uh, wash. Uh, for, uh, you, you mean obsessive compulsive disorder? Yes, yes, sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, it's nearby uh, PTT and, and Caesar. Uh, uh, for example, uh, PTT is, uh, is affect to Lenox, uh, to this, uh, is effective to Caesar, for example. It is cast out syndrome. Yes, Lennox Gasser syndrome. Yeah. yeah. So we tried uh, that uh, three cases to four cases. Maybe, yes, uh, that is very uh, effective. And, but uh, we uh, report it later. Sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah, and uh, also talking about MR guided focal ultrasound. Um, so technically with the focal guided ultrasound, we are also making the same lesion just like uh, by radio frequency listening, you know. And uh, since the target PTT is very close to the center, uh, focal ultrasound works better in central, uh, making central lesion rather than on peripheral lesion. So do you think um, in the future, because I, I, I know that uh, this uh, PTT is not recognized, uh, focal ultrasound on PTT is not recognized in Japan, uh, for uh, this insurance company has not recognized this. So do you think if the insurance company recognize you will move on to, rather than doing a radio frequency listening, you do a MR guided focal ultrasound? Do you think that possibility is there? Yes. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, focus, ultrasound, focus ultrasound is less effective for GPI because it is off center but uh, in case of PDT, it's nearby center, so it very is easy to uh, create lesion, easy to quadrate. So it's more effective than GPI. And we also tried uh, focused ultrasound uh, PDT for dystonia patient. It is effective. So maybe in the future, uh, focus ultrasound for PTT is covered, will be covered by insurance. Maybe I think so. And uh, for task specific dystonia, you recommended VO thalamotomy. And uh, so most of these patients are unilateral, mainly if they are right-handed, they have, will have repeated, because of repetitive use of that hand, they will have focal dystonia, like you showed in, you know, musicians, writers, typists. So then you do a left-sided um, BO thalamotomy, but there are patients who will also develop bilateral uh, focal dystonia. So do you have experience of doing a bilateral, staged, I would say, bilateral uh, BO thalamotomy? Thank you for your question. But in fact, I have no experience uh, performed bilateral BO thalamotomy. Yes, only on a unilateral BO thalamotomy. So maybe a uh, professor uh, Taira or Horisawa had experience, but I have no experience and I, I don't have read paper about that. I don't know about that, sorry. Thank you very much. So Professor Taira and uh, uh, myself, Professor Horisawa, uh, Resa is here, you know, she's also in the audience today. And there's a lot of people here on the audience so we all believe that uh, if DBS works uh, in a certain area, like especially in the case of dystonia, then um, uh, listening should work because we feel that uh, DBS, deep brain stimulation is a misnomer. Uh, it is not stimulating anything. It is actually suppressing that part of the brain. So whether you suppress it electrically, or by thermocoagulation, the result end result should be the same. So on belief of that, we have been doing similar type of surgeries. So I really thank you for your uh, sharing your experience to all of us and uh, hope uh, my regards, give my regards to uh, Professor Horisawa uh, and you know, Professor Taira, uh, we may not be there anymore, but uh, we love you all. <laughs> thank you. Professor Pan Panto Sensei. Panto Sensei. Hi. Hi. So we have a today the three discussants. Please ask them, please. Ask them? Ask. We have a three discussants. Yes. So please, please ask them, please, from your to side. Stay. To stay? No, no. You can ask them. Some, oh, okay. Okay. We have a, we, we have a three discussants yes, for, yes. for Kim. 
Okay, so uh, let's continue with the next uh, lecture. And uh, uh, Professor Rana, please uh, introduce the or uh, no, 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 no. Please, please ask a discussant. We have a three discuss discussant today. One, ah, one is Rabi Shark. Yes, for for Dr. Kim. Yeah. Well, it's okay. We understand. Oh, Professor Panta. Professor Abida is here. Maybe she can okay. throw us more light. Professor Abida, please. Hello, hello, Professor Kato. Hello. Dr. Yes. Hello. Hello, Dr. Panta. Oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. After a long time. Yeah, after a long time. So this is not my subject of interest, but I would just like to know, uh, Dr. Kim, do you lesion or stimulate the cingulum for any disorders? Cingulum. Excuse me, cingulum. Do you do anything with the cingulum in any psychiatric illness? Do you stimulate the cingulum or put a lesion in the cingulum for any disorders? Do you do that? Uh I have no experience about that, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. So we have, a, a very we, have one, we have one experience of making lesion on cingulum um, on a patient with uh, OCD. And uh, he had, uh, he could not, he needed a long, long time just to wear a shirt, you know, and uh, almost took about 45 minutes or so. So we did a bilateral simultaneous uh, cingulotomy and uh, anterior capsulotomy uh, for that OCD patient. And uh, fortunately that case uh, got better. That, that's the only case that we have in our series. So it does, it does work in some cases, you think? Yes, um, uh, cingulotomy and uh, um, you know, capsulotomy or uh, area 25 stimulation of area 25 or lesioning of area 25, it does work in uh, OCD and also in uh, drug resistant depression. But the problem is, you know, these are two different places. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to stimulate both places at the same time. So, and the usual cord that is made uh, only target one of these places. You can only target one of these places. Actually, the Chinese group has made a cord uh, which can uh, stimulate both places at the same time. And they are using that for um, uh, addiction. For addiction, they are using this court and uh, the company is called Sinre. And maybe you can go and look at it. But then we believe that if you can stimulate something, you can also make lesion on that area. So we have, uh, rather than going and doing a DBS, we did lesioning. Uh, about 20, 26 total lesions were made on, you know, 13 on each side. And on singular, there were three targets and uh, anterior, medial, and posterior targets. And it worked very well on that patient, yeah. So but we you, don't have... Yeah. If you stimulate the middle part of the singular or put a lesion in the uh, middle part of the singular, do you get anything like a SMA syndrome or no? because that is somehow linked with the motor network. Um, in each cases that we made a lesion, uh, we always stimulate uh, every part, you know, before making the lesion uh, to see okay. that we may not harm the patient and it's uh, done on awake. We, we didn't see any, any kind of SMA uh, sort of response on this, this uh, only one patient. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pant. Yeah. Raja? Raja. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me congratulate uh, Dr. Kilsu for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we really learned a lot, so this is not my fault, fault uh, DBS. Just I would like to uh, uh, ask Professor K Dr. Kilsu that, uh, you, as you said, newer frontiers for this uh, surgery uh, are being explored in the form of treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder or obsessive compulsive disorders. So in such psychiatric uh, cases, as you showed us in uh, dystonia, you have the twister score and all. How will you evaluate the outcome in uh, psychiatric illnesses? Because it is very difficult to have a uh, objective evaluation of improvement in psychiatric cases. So how do you do it in your place?
Excuse me, please. I can hear. Vasi, the question is in psychiatric illnesses where you use this uh, listening. How yes. will you evaluate the outcomes of patients? Do you have some specific scores like you have twister for dystonia? For scare? The twister score, that is the Toronto Western uh, yeah. Toronto scale. Do you have something in psychiatric illnesses? Uh, psychiatric evaluate the outcome. Yeah. Psychiatric biokini, shoots my to shoots no atono, anone, do ya te handan o sterun descate, scoring system. Santo Sensei, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. So, so we are working with a psychiatric department. So, and a doctor, uh, so Horisawa reported about the OCD patient treated by uh, PTT, but at that time, I'm not functional neurosurgeon, so <laughs> I have I understand. experience about that. And sorry, <laughs> yeah, right. I, thank you, I, thank you. Yeah, I understand. I, I understand. With, with the paper of OCD. Which is uh which uh Horisawa writing? Sorry, okay. I will check you. Thank you very much. So is Dr. Anu Thomas wants to add something. Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for the excellent presentation, which is explaining the basis of the TPP. I want to ask one doubt. Uh, how will you assess the outcome? Um, good, good, and bad for TPP. Can you hear me? Dr. Kilsu, the question is how will you assess the outcome in after PTT? I believe it is the same as for Twister score, improvement in Twister score, is it? Professor Bant, you can help us. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, we take a video uh, after one day or two day after surgery and scale the twisters at uh, or BFMDRS for arm dystonia scale. And then after one month, we check uh, it again in the outpatient. And then three months after, we check it again and check brain MRI. And then six months after, we check scare again and check brain MRI again. So. After one day and one month and three months and six months, we check the scale. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kim, for the answer. Thank you. Well. Hi. Let's go. 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 Uh, I invite if there's any further questions from the floor. No. So uh, if 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 not, uh, shall I uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Pan to uh, invite uh, to introduce our next uh, one speaker? Thank you, Professor Pan. So I am introducing uh, Dr. K. Ajit Kumar, and yes. he's going to uh, talk on role of dynamic DSA in the evaluation and management of Bo Hunter syndrome. Dr. Ajit Kumar, please. Good evening, everyone. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Kajit Kumar. Currently, I'm in my third year PG residency in neurosurgery department at the Indo-American Hospital, Kerala, India. Uh, today, my topic of presentation is the role of the Bowhunter syndrome, role of the dynamic digital subtraction angiography in the evaluation and management of the Bowhunter syndrome. Uh, these are the contents of my presentation today. Bowhunter syndrome, it's a vascular phenomenon characterized by the inception of the posterior cerebral circulation induced by the rotation of the head. In the literature, it was first described by the Sorensen in 1978. He described a patient who is an archer developed a Wallenberg syndrome during the practice of the archery. These are the various names given in the literature for the Bowhunter syndrome. It's known as the beauty parlor stroke, head and syncope, or positional or rotational vertebrobasilar ischemia uh, injury. The etiologies of the Bowhunter syndrome are very wide. Usually they extend from the craniovertebral junction to the cervical spine. And the etiologies can also be divided into groups as a primary or secondary. Uh, the most commonly the etiologies involving the subaxial spine are the most common causes of Bowhunter syndrome followed by the C1, C2 area and followed by the occipital cervical region. And, uh, among the secondary etiology, bony spurs are the osteophytes are the most common etiologies causing the Bowhunter syndrome. The anatomy of the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery arises from the first part of the subclavian artery and it has uh, four segments. This is the slide showing the four <laughs> parts of the vertebral artery and their branches. The first part is the extra osseous part, second is the foraminal, third is the extra spinal, and fourth is the intradural part of the vertebral artery. The third part of the vertebral artery, it has a um, long tortuous cross. It is lies between the exit part where it exits the C2 transverse foramen and uh, uh, till the where it pierces the posterior atlanta occipital membrane and uh, becomes the fourth part of the vertebral artery. Uh, due to this uh, long and uh, tortuous course from C2 transverse foramen up to the posterior atlanta occipital membrane, it can get stretch, straighten, and bend during the rotation of the head. It provides the extra length for the artery to uh, overcome the head movement. But uh, during the head rotation, usually up to the 35 degrees of the rotation, the third part of the vertebral artery can get elongated. And uh, when the head rotation is goes beyond the 45 degrees, the flow within the artery will become occluded. And uh, in extreme rotation, there will be a endothelial damage to the artery causing the posterior circulation infarcts. The clinical features for the Bowhunter syndrome, they ranges from a mild transient dizziness uh, or a syncopial attack to a severe uh, posterior circulation infarcts. And uh, usually uh, the patients who are having the Bowhunter syndrome, they typically have these symptoms develops after a prohibit head movement. The first patient... The first patient, which was uh, described uh, by Sorensen, in an archery practitioner, the archers who turn their head to one side and keep in that position for the prolonged period. Similarly, the almost all the patients, there will be a specific provocative head movement which will causing the transient symptoms of the Bowhunter syndrome. The usual imaging modalities for the Bowhunter syndrome are the CT and CT angiography, MRI and MRI angiography, Doppler study, and dynamic uh, digital subtraction angiography. The CT and CT angio, it's a first line imaging modality commonly done. The advantage of the uh, CT is that it shows the anatomical relationship between the vessel and the surrounding uh, uh, anatomical pathology can be well demonstrated. The problem with the CT and CT angio is that uh, when the head is turned to one side to reproduce the symptom or to uh, show the reduced flow of the vessel, the head needs to be in that position for a longer period. Whereas the usually the image acquisition time will range us in minutes. Whereas the Bowhunter syndrome, it can develop within a few seconds. So this is the disadvantage of the CT angio.
the second modality is the mr and uh, mr angio the advantage for the mri is that it shows the ischemic changes in the posterior circulation area are very well and uh, it can be done without contrast and uh, it's less invasive the disadvantage is same as the ct angio the head needs to be turned in the provocative position for the image acquisition time longer periods and uh, it will be uh, difficult and dangerous for the patient the doppler study doppler study is a easily performing fast tool screening tool which can uh, gives the details of the flow of the vessel it is non invasive and uh, less expensive the disadvantage for the doppler study it is highly operative operator dependent and uh, in case of a multiple compressions present in the vertebral artery it does not show much details and uh, it does not show the vascular anomalies collateral better com uh, as compared to the other modalities and uh, in case of uh, hypoplastic uh, artery the information is uh, less reliable to so the next uh, modality the dynamic digital subtraction angiography compared to the all it is the most accurate imaging modality the flow in the vessel which can be demonstrated in real time within seconds so the patient head can be turned back to neutral position is very faster before the development of symptoms the accuracy is very high so it is the considered as a gold standard imaging modality for evaluation it can also show the associated anomalies collateral circulations communications dominance of the vessel and anatomical variations so it's a safe imaging modality and uh, the information acquired will be useful for planning the surgery uh, coming to the case discussion the first patient she is a 14 year old student she is also a classical dancer and a yoga practitioner uh, patient sustained a transient syncopal attack and the sustained a head injury and a, uh, on the uh, taking the history patient had a similar episodes of uh, transient loss of consciousness or giddiness while practicing the yoga and the patient father gave us this uh, cctv footage of the video which happened when she is practicing yoga at her home she bent her head back for a long period and she sustained a syncopal attack and she had fall on the floor uh on taking the history she had a similar uh, symptoms in the past where she practicing the dance she is usually gets a transient dizziness attacks her provocative history was the extreme hyperextension of the head or rotation of the neck will produce the syncope uh, on the presentation she doesn't have any neurological deficits so initially we did a mri brain and mr angio imaging study uh, the flare imaging showed no evidence of the posterior circulation areas the patient had a uh, dental implants because of that uh, the images were uh, uh, there were artifacts in the images the mr angio there was no evidence of any flow anomalies in the source image but the reconstructed image was uh, getting affected due to the dentures so then we went for the then we did the dynamic dsa in this patient this is the first injection left vertebral artery injection in a head in the neutral position the flow in the left vertebral artery is uh, normal and uh, left vertebral artery when the head is turned to the contralateral side meaning towards the right side the flow is completely get obstructed at the c1 c2 area and uh, the flow is like a pulse which is pushing the contrast into the vessel which is completely getting blocked at the c1 c2 level and uh, on turning the head to the back to neutral the flow in the left vertebral artery was uh, restored Uh, the right vertebral artery dsa in the neutral position the flow in the right vertebral artery is grossly within normal limits no evidence of any obstruction when the head is turned to the contralateral side mean towards the left side the flow is also normal no evidence of any obstruction 
uh, this is the right vertebral artery uh, had turned to the ipsilateral side ipsilateral side the flow is normal then we did a dynamic uh, ct study to assess the uh, anatomical status uh, the dynamic ct in the neutral position of the head there was no any evidence of any subluxation or a dislocation it was grossly within the normal limits the flex dynamic ct of the flexion study and extension study both were also normal then the ct in the right rotated position of the head there is a rotatory atlanto axial subluxation which is seen here there is a um, this is the ct which is taken in the right rotation position then the ct in the left rotation showing dynamic uh, uh, atlanto axial rotatory subluxation so since the patient had a uh, multiple episodes of uh, recurrent attacks uh, and uh, the dynamic dsa is uh, the obstruction which is at the c1 c2 it's corresponding to the pathology uh, which is in the ct so we went for a posterior cervical fusion and fixation the patient was symptom free after the surgery and uh, she is written back to her dancing practice this is the video of her practicing in a uh, event 3 months after the surgery the patient was completely symptom free and uh, able to do her work the second patient the second patient was a 60 year old male he is a daily worker in working in mumbai he presented with history of uh, neck pain and uh, bilateral brachialgia and his clinical uh, evaluation features were suggestive of above c5 myelopathy along with that the patient has given a uh, history of uh, recurrent attacks of giddiness blacking out episodes he described it as uh, when he try to cross the road he looks for the side of the road to check the oncoming traffic when he check the traffic and walk in the road before even reaching the middle of the road he gets a dizziness attack or a black out episode for which he will come back and sit to relieve the symptoms it was happen multiple times and it is putting him in a uh, dangerous situation so the provocative history for this patient is a uh, looking to the left side he develops uh, blackout episodes his uh, initial x ray imaging study showed no evidence of any subluxation or dislocation and then the mri imaging study showed a large discostophytic compression of the ventral cord at the c4 5 level and the cord myelomalacia changes the left vertebral artery is uh, size is smaller than the right vertebral artery since there is a pro, uh, recurrent episodes of uh, features suggestive of bow hunter syndrome we went for a dynamic uh, digital subtraction angiography for this uh, the ct imaging showed a discontinuous uh, opll along with uh, uh bony indentation of the left vertebral canal whereas the right vertebral canal is wider and the left is shorter so we went for a dynamic dsa in this patient this is the uh, left vertebral artery injections the first one is in the head is in the neutral position uh, which is showing the vessel is hypoplastic the flow is present but the entire uh, vessel is hypoplastic when the head is turned to the ipsilateral side meaning towards the left side the flow is getting occluded at approximately c4 c5 level and the when the head is turned back to the contralateral side that is towards the right side the flow is restored then with the right vertebral artery injections the right vertebral artery in the neutral position the vessel caliber and flow within the vessel is normal is the right vertebral artery when the head is turned to the uh, contralateral side that is towards the left side there is no evidence of any occlusion or obstruction to the flow and uh, when the head is turned to the ipsilateral that is towards the right side there is no evidence in, uh, no evidence of any occlusion 
uh, this is a uh, uh, sim, uh, image to show appro uh, approximately the vertebral artery is getting affected at the vertebral canal by the bony osteophyte. Uh, patient uh, underwent anterior cervical corpectomy and uh, vertebral artery decompression and fusion. The patient was symptom free after the procedure. This is the post op image showing the position of the implants. The third patient, the third patient was a 12 year old boy. He tried, attempted a somersault, like a gymnastic kind of movement, turning the whole body uh, based, uh, based on the head. After that, he developed neck pain, headache, vomiting, and swaying while walking. And uh, at the time of admission, his uh, clinical examination showed features of cerebellar ataxia. His uh, initial X-ray imaging study showed there is a reducible atlanto-oxial dislocation. And uh, his MRI study showed acute right cerebellar infarct. His MR angiography showed occlusion of the right vertebral artery, right vertebral artery dissection. And uh, CT cervical spine showed increase in the condylar C1 interval and uh, hypoplastic right posterior arch of the atlas and uh, fused C1, C2, C3 vertebrae. Since the patient uh, presented as with the established posterior circulation infarct and vertebral artery dissection, the patient was initially started on a loma uh, anticoagulant therapy and his uh, uh, repeat imaging study showed a resolving, uh, uh, resolving cerebellar infarct. Since the infarct is, uh, uh, since the flow, flow in the right vertebral artery is uh, restored with anticoagulant therapy and the patient had a uh, reducible atlanto occipital uh, dislocation. There were two options uh, for the management. One is the endovascular approach to the uh, address the vertebral artery dissection and also a surgical management for the atlanto occipital dislocation. Since the vertebral artery dissection was responding to the anticoagulant therapy and uh, uh, endovascular approach like a uh, flow diversion alone uh, in the presence of a dynamic uh, uh, dynamic dislocation uh, has very less outcome compared to the um, can, uh, compared to the surgical fixation. So patient underwent uh, posterior occipital cervical fusion and fixation. The patient was also symptom free after the uh, procedure. His repeat imaging studies showed a uh, resolution in the symptoms and there was no episodes of any Bohunter syndrome. So comparison, uh, we have three cases of the Bohunter syndrome. The first patient, the 14-year-old girl, is a juvenile primary Bohunter syndrome due to Atlanta axial ligament laxity. The second patient is an adult secondary Bohunter syndrome due to a bony osteophyte com compressing the left vertebral artery. And the third patient is a juvenile primary Bohunter syndrome due to a reducible atlanto occipital dislocation. The age uh, two patients are a uh, young patient and one patient is a old patient. One patient, the pathology is lies at a C1, C2 level. The other patient pathology lies at C4, C5 level. And the third patient pathology lies at occipito C1 level. The two patients received dynamic, uh, in the two patients, we did a dynamic DSA study, whereas in the third patient, we haven't done the dynamic DSA because the patient already had an established posterior circulation, in fact. Do, uh, uh, performing a dynamic study, either DSA or a CT, will be uh, risky and complications will be present. So we didn't go for a dynamic DSA in the third patient. Uh, since the dynamic DSA is a real-time imaging and uh, it can be done in the patient with provocative symptoms. The total duration of the imaging is very shorter. And uh, as soon as the uh, image acquisition time is very shorter, so we can turn the head back to the normal position early. So it is a very safe procedure. And uh, it is considered as a gold standard procedure in the diagnosis of Bowhunter syndrome. It, uh, you gives useful information for the planning for the surgery. It can pinpoint the pathology in the patients. And uh, the dynamic studies should be avoided in patients with established vascular injuries. The Bowhunter syndrome, is, uh, within the literature, it is extremely rare. 
it is a rare cause of the vertebro basilar insufficiency but it is a treatable cause the imaging plays important role in the diagnosis of the bowhunter syndrome a standard imaging might not always exclude the diagnosis so dynamic dsa is a gold standard procedure in the diagnosis of bowhunter syndrome thank you thank you very much uh, dr or uh, but uh, it was a very very interesting uh, you know presentation and i'm sure a lot of us learned uh, many things and one of the take home messages i would like to add in your uh, take home message would be you know you should be really suspicious because i i'm sure we have been missing this kind of you know diagnosis all the time so you have to be really really suspicious and go through the pain of doing or dynamic dsa in a case of what i know so i think this is a very interesting case uh, and uh, the floor is open for discussion any questions from the yes uh, if i may start uh, first of all uh, congrats to uh, dr ajit and uh, of course dr anu thomas who is his mentor and he has presented beautifully and uh, done a fantastic job with this case so uh, one question to dr ajit is since she had this dental implants and you said the images were not so uh, good in the first mr angio so why, why didn't you go for a, uh, a 3d ct angiogram with a dynamic 3d ct angiogram how would have been uh, uh, earlier to detect this because it is much readily available than going in for a dsa what what are your thoughts uh, since the patient history is specifically suggesting the features of bowhunter syndrome and uh, within the literature the evidence that the pickup rates of the flow anomalies with a dynamic dsa is uh, very better than the dynamic ct or the mri study so because of those reasons we went for a dynamic dsa sir since it is available you could have picked up two pathologies uh, in the dynamic ct you could have got that rotary axis subluxation as well as the narrowing of vertebral artery also by doing a cta is consider it? the safety of the procedure also the patient head needs to be put in that uh, provocative position for longer till the image is acquired so whereas then the D dynamic dsa we can turn as early as possible so considering the ct and the pickup rate so we went for a dynamic dsa sir. Okay, so Sir Abida would like to say something. It was a very good presentation, Dr. Ajit. And uh, one good take-home message is Bowhunter syndrome is uh, not a very common, but it is a presentation of atlantoaxial instability. And if it does present, you have to look for atlantoaxial instability for sure. We have also seen four or five patients having a similar presentation. Some of them. actually come with a pica infarct even you know recently i had a patient who was 70 years old came with a pica infarct and uh, imaging showed an atlantoaxial instability my question is uh, two when your dsa was done and there was reduced flow on when your the side artery was getting compressed did the patient develop symptoms while doing the dsa uh, usually the turning back is very early so most uh, the two patient didn't had any symptoms during the dsm because uh, both your patients with that left vertebral artery had hypoplastic vertebral artery the other side was actually dominant so i am a little surprised that you know i don't know what is the role uh, of that uh, you know occlusion that was seen in the dsa at that time if there were no symptoms the range of the symptoms which develops from the mild uh, transient syncopal attacks usually in the standing position are to a severe posterior circulation in fact the rarity is rarity of the bowhunter syndrome is due to even a one side vertebral artery is getting affected the flow is get compensated by the opposite vertebral artery and also by the uh, communication between the anterior circulation through the pcom in the presence of any hypoplastic artery or a vascular anomaly the chances of development of the symptoms to the severe range will be present in this patient uh, in this uh, in the two patients which we did the opposite first 14 year old girl the right vertebral artery was uh, 
completely vessel caliber is normal and it was able to maintain the flow so in a slight uh, head rotation which can that head rotation can show the uh, flow getting occluded of the left vertebral artery without even before the production of the symptoms because the right will get compensate the flow in the dsa one video the when the head is rotated to the right side and the right vertebral artery injection the right vertebral artery is going up to the uh, flow from the right vertebral artery is going also towards the left side up to the c1 c2 level so in the extreme rotation of the head the, while performing the dynamic dsa might reproduce the symptom rather uh, than a uh, minimal head rotation might not produce the symptom and uh, even the most common symptom will be a syncope which is usually the patient will be in a standing position will get the loss of balance response so it is very uh, the two patients didn't develop any symptom so i mean if if i had a patient to develop typically with the bowen trust syndromes mm -hmm. as dr raja said first i will do the dynamic ct to see if there is definite instability probably we will not need the dsa we will just go ahead and you know treat the instability so that you avoid uh, invasive procedure of course it helps in the diagnosis but that is what i would do and uh, second second question is first patient you there was no change in the adi so what prompted to it was a very good catch i agree but what prompted you to do a rotational ct and uh, ct of the patient which showed the subluxation uh initially we did a flexion extension but there was no evidence of any subluxation so on the moment it was uh, continued to do a left and right rotation of the head to complete the study you, you do it routinely no ma'am one explanation is the provocative history is uh, on extension and rotation the symptoms uh, was uh, produced so that is why we go for a rotational uh, study now that was a very good catch i mean very good catch and very good treatment of that patient thank you. so anyways very good presentation thank you very much thank you ma'am i think ben has a question if yes. you don't if you don't really uh, that's why i said you know the add add on take on message would be you know for arun uh, is uh, a suspicion very very high degree of, unless you have a very very high degree of suspicion you won't go into a trouble of you know making that level of investigation so that way you know uh, it's absolutely good catch and uh, what i go patient in the past every what i go was from the cervical you know when i was practicing 25 years ago every vertigo was from cervical without even studying anything uh, now that we know you know um, unless there is a severe ischemia severe compromise of the vertebral basilar insufficiency you don't have vertigo from the you know posterior circulation and which you have very nicely you know presented and uh, there's a lot of things that we have learned today thank you very much thank you very much uh can i ask a question uh, uh uh thank you so much uh, for your uh, uh, uh this uh, in very interesting uh, presentation so uh this uh, not a common situation that i encounter but uh and thank you so much for sharing uh, the cases so maybe in some cases that in the cervical instability that i encounter there might be a possible uh a bow hunter syndrome that i could have uh, missed out uh, uh without an angiogram. So uh, thank you so much and congratulate your team uh, for uh, for your for handling those uh, cases. So my question is that uh, during uh, the during the fusion surgery um, uh, in this uh, patient, uh, how how do you design how much uh, kyphosis you need to attain uh, when you perform the fixation? Uh, or how do you assess uh, the uh, the patency of the vessels during the operation uh, to decide the degree of the kyphosis you want to attain. Is it uh, you lay open the, uh, is, is it, for example, by uh, by just by the intra, uh, the IOM uh, monitoring, or is it, uh, for example, by using a Doppler or intra-op angiogram? Mm. I'm sorry, I'm actually in a very early phase of my neurosurgery. Uh, of course, sir. Uh, I know Thomas can answer that. 
For all these three cases, uh, the flow was normal in neutral position. Only when there was a provocative position, this occlusion has happened. So uh, our aim was uh, to fuse in the physiological position, that is in the neutral position for C1-C2 and the Atlanta occipital joint, which will be one confirmed by radiologically, that is uh, using an intraoperative CT scan. All these cases were done under neuromonitoring. So we were able to uh, pick up for any early physiology changes in the SSCP or MVP during. Then Docker study also intraoperatively was done to assess the patency. But we don't find any uh, change in the flow when it was kept in the physiological or in the neutral position. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, so uh, shall I uh, invite uh, further questions on the floor? If not, uh, shall I invite uh, Professor Penn to introduce our third speaker? So if there is no question, then uh, I would like to invite an expert speaker, uh, Professor Naoki Otan from uh, New York University, and he's going to talk about surgical treatment strategy of glioma in Nihon University Hospital. Professor Naoki. Thank you for, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, I can share my slide. Just a moment, please. Can, can we? Yes, can uh, right? yes, ah, please. Okay. Can, we, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, uh, doctor, thank you so uh, Dr. Liu and uh, Professor Yoko Kato for invitation and uh, giving my opportunity to uh, present my clinical works. And so today I would like to talk about uh, how do we perform glioma surgery? Yes, and uh, entitled the surgical treatment strategies for glioma uh, in my uh, Nihon University Hospital. That's, uh, I think it's a, a standard, standard uh, so surgical strategies we usually uh, performed. So uh, it's today's talk. Uh, contents of my uh, talk, I uh, summarized in my slide. So at first, uh, recent changes uh, in confirmed diagnosed the, um, diffuse malignant glioma. Uh, I see uh, you, you can see the, so, uh, so um, this uh, field is progressively uh, improving. And next, about radiographical uh, evaluation, 3, uh, 3D reconstruction and tractography, and secondary about our intraoperative strategies on glioma surgery, in particular adult diffuse malignant glioma. And finally, I would like to talk uh, about the touch, uh, I would like to touch on post-surgical therapy, irradiation and thermodynamic and treatment for recurrent malignant glioma. So uh, at first, until uh, 2007, uh, you see it was classified based on histological morphology uh, to uh, definitive uh, diagnosis for malignant diffuse astrocytum. But uh, 2000, uh, 16 molecular classification was introduced uh, at first, and the genotypes such as IDH mutant were also included. And then seven recommendations at the C uh, impact now were made to lead the division of the uh, WH classification. Uh, which is not enough to be revised once every five years. So, and the uh, uh, new classification of the 2021, molecular diagnosis had become an important part of malignant brain tumor management. 
So uh, pediatrics and adult glioma are uh, now classified independently. In adult diffuse glioma, there are just only three types class classified. On the other hand, in pediatric type, uh, they are just only uh, so uh, diffuse glioma uh, classified into four tumor types in each for low grade and high grade respectively. It is important to note that uh, the pediatric type symptom can occur even in adults. It cannot be divided just simply by age. So I will show the difference between the IDH mutant, mutant mutants and wild type, which as a mutant is positive and mutation is uh, negative, it's a wild type. Surely it's depend on the whether there is a genetic mutation uh, that is namely mean that uh, the 132 second amino acid of IDH1 changed from uh, arginine to histidine like this. So you, you know, uh, only just uh, small changes, but the uh, tumor behavior on the mutation positively is uh, very, very changed. Uh, so and next, I will show the uh, de deletion of the chromosome 1 and 9, uh, 19, 1P90Q loss. So co-deleted. Co so scientists have labeled each of the arms of the chromosomes. The short arm is called P for petit in French, means small in English. The long arm is so called Q simply because it's the next letter in the alphabetical, only just meaning. You see the, uh, this is a chromosome one and the chromosome 19. The 1P19Q loss means that at first, 1P on both chromosomes replaced in each other, and then 1P90Q gradually uh, deleted, like this. So now molecular testing to evaluate it for these IDH, IDH mutation and 1P90Q code deletion are now mandatory for making the definitive uh, diagnosis histologically. So based on the result of the 1P90Q loss following IDH1 mutation, previously, uh, histomorphologically classified and uh, grade two and three, uh, oligodendroglioma and astrocytom, as well as grade four or glioblastoma malform was further classified according to the uh, presence or absence of the molecular uh, changes. So secondary, preoperatively we evaluated location Locational, uh, tumor locational relationships, the tumor with vessels uh, using uh, 3D CT uh, A and A3 and uh, uh, Venus reconstructed. In addition, as you see, tractography will be useful to classify the learning of the neuronal bundle adjacent to the tumors to avoid or minimum uh, fiber injuries. You see the, which is a, a lateral surface and this is a medi uh, medial surface. So you see the lateral surface is composed of these um, several fascicles. So you uh, have to, and on the other hand, the medial surface is composed of these uh, fascicles. So we have to, uh, so, uh, care these fibers uh, running so to uh, tumor uh, removal. So I will show the several cases. Uh, next, uh, so um, uh, interoperative surgical strategies. 
So, uh, so maximal rejection, maximal rejection with preserving brain function is uh, most important thing. So for these uh, maximal rejection with preserving brain function, these modalities will be useful and needed. Of course, intraoperative monitoring, uh, navigation, and uh, intraoperative CT MRI, and the five amino lebric acid, and uh, uh, our exaggerated. So, um, and in addition, the uh, QSER and the endoscope, and the sometimes intraoperative fluorescent angiography, these instruments also help us for accomplish safe and precise surgical rejection. Uh, however, in our uh, hospital, uh, we do not have intraoperative CT and MRI. So we use other technique using navigation instead. So I will show the uh, several uh, cases. So this case uh, presented with left hemiparesis, ring life enhancement located medial temporal gyrus and contact with the internal carotids. So at first, we usually set the tube using intraoperative navigation to determine the extent and the depth of the resection of the tumor into a cerebral parenchyma, setting the intraoperative uh, contents monitoring. And uh, at first, optic nerve and the carotid artery was uh, confirmed. And as uh, explained to you, would, uh, so I see and the perforators and the anterior uh, arteries uh, engulfed by the tumors. So at first, uh, I see perforators, these uh, uh, vessels uh, were dissected. Uh, so because of these vital uh, vessel structures uh, from the tumors and and then the QSA instrument was used to, to evaluate the main tumors as much as possible uh, using the already placed tube as a guide. It's a final view. So post operative MRI showed enhanced region was evaluated. And next case, uh, which, is a, so which is the next case of five, uh, Fibala was useful to evaluate the tumors and uh, confirm the tumor location using the navigation, transcortical dissection, and the tumor came into view. So rapid histological check was done, and tumor characters was so soft and hemorrhagic, and you see tumor boundary was relatively clear. So using QSA instrument, tumor evacuation was continued as if following the boundary surface uh, of the tumor was uh, confirmed. Uh, and at the same time, I will also proceed with the cautery with bipolar for, uh, forceps to stop the bleedings. So remnant tumor was de detected using five R you see remnant tumor uh, can be confirmed in, uh, in red colors. You see, finally you see the remnant tumor was just removed. And uh, so, so partially opened the trigon, the lateral uh, ventricle was sealed with the material with fibrin glue. And uh, so you see the post of the view was even uneventful. And uh, I would like to do, introduce the surgical approaches that are gentle for the dominant hemisphere. First, obstetric interhemisphere transprecranial approach is gravity retraction. You see all uh, indicated by green arrows with minimum brain retraction and brain injury contusion, we can easily approach to the tumors. 
And next uh, approach is, uh, let me see then. So, uh, contralateral interhemispheric transformation approach with gravity retraction for left uh, medial frontal regions, as uh, indicated by green arrows with minimum brain retraction and brain injury contusion, we can easily approach, uh, approach for the tumors. So these uh, approaches will be helpful uh, for um, with minimum uh, contusion of the uh, eloquent hemispheres. And we will perform the uh, awake surgery for left language area. You see that we estimated the making area with real time checking the speech condition like this. If we confirm the speech area stimulation causes aphasia, so we will make uh, making and then we will attempt to remove the tumor while avoiding that uh, risky area. So this is uh, awake surgery. Uh, sometimes it, uh, is very useful. And uh, uh, extent of the tumor resection for glioma, uh, traditionally total ex uh, resection of the contrast enhanced area significantly prolong the overall survival. This paper showed useful of the total resection of the control, contrast enhanced area. And uh, of course, of course, uh, useful the left side, but uh, recently additional phrenectomy will be useful for prolongation of the survival rate. You see the, uh, more than 53% uh, of phrenectomy significantly prolonged overall survival. So uh, I will show the, uh, so like this case, light frontal uh, region can be maximum dissection of the T2 phrenia uh, region like this, uh, almost uh, frontal lobectomy. You see it. Uh, so then, then uh, so post-operative MRI, so the remnant uh, T2 uh, change area is so uh, small. However, on the other hand, it will be difficult to resect the extent of the tumor, including free area in eloquent uh, located region. So these uh, it will be the uh, future issues, I think. And uh, the, uh, finally, post-surgical therapy, irradiation and temozolamid, and treatment for recurrent malignant glion. So I will show the, uh, you the surgical management for initial glioblastoma multiforme interoperatively, we usually detain the interoperatively calmustin buffers on the tumor bed. This agent is a nitrosoluble uh, alkylating agent. This buffer is a sustained releasing the uh, for formulation for intracellular dwelling. And it's just on the clinical trial uh, so in Japan, the National Cancer Research Center in Tokyo is now currently collecting the patient who underwent electrical uh, magnetic field treatment like this. So we usually, uh, so thermodynamic radiation is, uh, so after uh, so management, uh, so therapies is continued. And on the other hand, for the treatment of, of the recurrent glioma, abastin therapy, uh, so bevacizumab is usually used for advanced malignant glioma, including recurrence and delayed radiation necrosis. Abastin selectively inhibits the activation of the VEGF. 
So this is expected to slow tumor growth and reduce brain edema. So I will show the one case, which a recent one case, which showed rapid growth preoperatively, tumor removal. Uh, so pre just uh, two weeks, and uh, so you see the tumor is rapidly growing. So uh, in operatively, tumor removal were performed as usual, and post-operative MRI uh, showed total removal of enhanced uh, region without no complication. So uh, after surgery, the uh, irradiation and the temodal, um, temodal post therapy was performed. And nine months after these treatment, uh, edema was progressively worsening and the left hemiparesis occurred. And then we are afraid of recurrence of the tumor, we used the Abastin therapy, administrated intravenously. One month after the injection, uh, edema has been improved. So although uh, the possibility of the radiation necrosis cannot be ruled out, because the FDP, FDGP PET will be required. And then two months after that, just uh, last Friday, we have found a newly enhanced high pareto region. So we have to keep abastin therapy uh, in futures. So, so we come to the end of the presentation. So I am happy you can get any knowledge through my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. <clears throat> I invite uh, comments from our chair, Professor Pan. Yeah, Professor Otani, thank you very much for uh, one of the most common uh, surgery that is being done in any neurosurgical department. Still very, very challenging. Uh, we could do a lot of innovation. Uh, and we are only gaining marginal benefit from each new technology, maybe adding few months, few more months of recurrent free survival. But then you have given us an overall, you know, picture of how to approach. Uh, only one technology is not going to answer. So you have to have different technologies. If it is not in an eloquent area, try to remove as much as possible and uh, you know adjuvant therapy and so on and so forth thank you very much and the uh, floor is open for for the questioning and uh, if there's any question yeah, I invite, there, yeah maybe a, a, a professor Hiba, a Shiba, do you have any comment on these topics uh thank you dr otani that was a fantastic presentation and uh, i would like to ask you how does your surgical strategy differ between them surgical surgery wise sorry uh, doctor most um, of the cases you showed one, one were high grade glaucomas i can i cannot uh, take your uh, question please okay. one more please yeah. I, I, can, I will repeat it i will repeat it repeat it yeah yeah yes yes so most of the tumors you showed were high grade gliomas right yes majority yes, yes. so is your yes, surgical yes. strategy same for both high and low grade glioma uh, no 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 uh, ah. so yeah of course uh, so for the uh, low grade glioma we have to uh, more uh, so we have to remove the more volume the, than uh, so low grade uh, so high grade glioma, and so I have to so take care. Uh, so um, anaplastic, anaplastic, so called anaplastic high grade glioma, grade three should be uh, most. Uh, so extent of the uh, resection should be a, a, for for the uh, for the uh, grade four glioblastoma multiforme is uh, just uh, 
just uh, so stop the open open biopsy is because uh, so uh, to uh, I, I think it's the most important thing is to preserve the uh, brain function uh, for the uh, so glioblastoma uh, glioblastoma. So I, I always uh, uh, so change the uh, extent of the uh, brain resection uh, to tumor resection intraoperatively. Uh, so after checking the intraoperative uh, frozen checking, after, after frozen checking. So I, 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 yes, I, think you, I agree. I agree with you that it is more important to preserve function in high grade glioma because you know they have a very short time and it is better to give yeah. a good quality yeah. of life to the patient. Yeah. So yeah. a lot a lot of our glioma work is based on my white fiber dissection. So we have found that surgically we find a plane of dissection between the normal and the abnormal in both low and high grade gliomas, you know. Yeah. So we yeah. think yeah. so I think the tumor you know arises from one named fight mitre fiber. So suppose it is in the gyrus, it will arise yeah. from the short arcuate fibers in the gyrus and it will displace the adjacent one. So very yes, yes. many, we find yes. a good plane of dissection. So what do you think? Yeah, uh, as, as you explained, I always, uh, so key, I always care. So during the dissection of the uh, tumors, uh, so, uh, Usually, usually, the, uh, so in, in the in actual operation, we cannot uh, see the running of the uh, neuronal uh, so bundles, of course. But uh, so uh, so um, using uh, so no 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 uh, using the experience of the fiber dissection. Uh, so I I remember so I so. Um, so then tumor a bit so relationship with the tumor and the, and the tumor so I know you're the, saying uh, that so you understand yeah, yeah. yeah the three dimensional so, so, uh, you know the relation the three dimensional yes, no. structure you know in your mind so you can preserve the fight fiber right yes, as as much as uh, so preserve the fiber of fiber uh, bundles yes yes so that is what I would like to say that. Yes, we have good technology and we have everything, but anatomy is also important for glioma surgery because you cannot damage a white fiber. You have to keep it in mind while selecting your approach and also while uh, you know uh, limiting your resection within those boundaries. So thank you, Professor Otani. That was a very good yeah, thank presentation. You. Thank yes. you for your... So just, one, just, one, just I want to ask Otani Sensei. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for a nice presentation. Uh, because uh, Abida Shah, that he mentioned, is it easy to find the uh, dissecting plane uh, according to the, the fiber for your case? How do you think about it? Yeah, yeah. Mm, so, mm. case by case. It's, it's, yeah, it's a depend on the adhesion. There's, Adhesion, the tumor character, it depends on the tumor characteristics mm -hmm. uh, of the, uh, so adhesive or not, with uh, mm -hmm. uh, adjusting the five, uh, normal brain, mm -hmm. it depends okay. on the adhesive changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amira, do you agree that? Uh, Professor Gato, nowadays we are finding a good plane of resection. You just have to look for it, you know, with experience, with the, you know, visit, you can see also sometimes with the naked eye and you can feel it. The consistency of the normal brain from the abnormal is always a little different. Even in a low-grade glioma, it will be a little firmer than a, you know, normal brain tissue. And we are able to get the plane very, very nicely. Except, you so, know, in diffuse gliomas, we are not, but in localized... Mm -hmm. We are in diffuse. Also, there is a plane, but because the nature of the glioma is such that we would not, you know, advise going like that. But we are able to get a good plane. So the, the glioma tissues, uh, they usually the softer than a normal. For right. a high, 
for a high grade yes but mm-hmm. for a low grade they are more firmer they are rubbery you know they are not uh, the normal brain is little more better okay thanks so in in our institute you know uh, if we see a patient with a very bad looking uh, glioma and the patient age is let's say more than 70 and um, then we give them generally we give them three options and um, the option one would be not a curative treatment from from day one we don't we don't we tell them that you know probably treatment is not going to help you do you want to go for surgery or radiation or you know whatever such adjuvant therapy and um, we also give them a second option of just doing a stereotactic biopsy and um, getting a histological confirmation of our diagnosis and then thirdly uh, doing a extensive you know maximal safe resection kind of surgery that uh, professor utani just showed you i have got two questions to you one is do you still practice this kind of do you give you know option of not doing anything to a very very old man with a, a nasty looking tumor number one and number two you do a surgery you give them a you know relatively good life of a year and then there's a recurrence the patient comes to you and ask for a second surgery what do you say at this situation so two questions to you one is whether you say no surgery to any patient or you operate on all cases uh, thank you thank you for your question so uh... at first the second question yeah. at first for second question okay okay so i i will uh, so you know, for for the uh, so uh recurrent glioma so i will i will de- perform the de operation for the uh, so non eloquent area non eloquent area but if a eloquent area extended the eloquent area i i will not so uh, so uh, perform the uh, so additional operation so but uh, one question is uh, uh, please question number one is if the patient you look at the mri the tumor you think it is a very high grade glioma by your look yeah, yeah. and maybe yeah. mrs also suggests that it is a high grade glioma Yeah, and yeah. the patient is old do you give them an old. option uh, old. of not doing anything um, not operating do you give option of doing nothing or only treating you know systemic systemic management only yeah i i will uh, so co- conservative conservative treatment yeah uh, I, you give I, yeah, the option no, not, yeah yeah okay. oh, of course of course because But, uh, i when i was a resident in japan you know i read a paper yeah. where there was one group of people where mm-hmm. conservative treatment was given just like you said who didn't want to get operated and there was a group of people who had everything and the result were long term result were not very different this is about 25 years ago yeah. Yeah. so things have changed now mm. is it better now I- with treatment <laughs> i i, I mm, yeah, it's it depends on the case by cases yeah yeah but so, it is national course, national yeah. result of japan o tai se se ima no so high grade de gazou mite high grade de e koreisha dattara sensei wa doui option wo kanja san ni shimasu ka to ma 25 nen mai boku ga naratta toki ni wa e ka tette de kin chiyou ano ガンガン取って治療したっていうのと、はい、コンサバに見たっていうのとあまり結果は違わなかったと思うんだけど今はどうなってますかって、はいはいはい、いい質問でした。いやありがとうございます。はい。<笑> thank you thank you professor Kato so so explain the in details <笑>。先生のごご意見いかがでしょうか。あいやいやあのそう、so, uh, I think it's、uh, so uh, so I repeated my opinion。so case by cases and we need the most important thing is uh, uh, so patients just patients and the patient philosophy and 
family help. Helpful of a family is most important uh, factors. I think so. But uh, uh, result of the uh, so treatments maybe not so uh, uh, differences Different. of so uh, no, all the patient or uh, all the patient. More, of course, younger patient is uh, uh, so. You operate. Uh, you operate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, yeah. of course. And <laughs> I, I just, I I just sent uh, to, to but uh, in the older patient is not so. Uh, uh, it depends on the uh, family. Yes, yes. I, 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 I ask um, as I Thank you very much. You. Well, thanks, Sensei. Thank you. We understand. Thanks, Dr. Raza. A question from the floor. Uh, yes, can I ask a question uh, to Professor Otani? <coughs> so, uh, I'm from Hong Kong. So, my question. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, so, uh, my question is about so in in Japan, uh, how useful is the next generation sequencing is? So, how much, uh, how often will the oncologist uh, give a new potential targeted therapies? to those uh, patients based on the uh, next generation sequencing result. I, yeah, sorry, I don't know the in detail about the uh, field. So, so next, um, uh, one more, please. Could... Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, yes, uh, so, um, May I ask uh, in Japan, so uh, how useful uh, is the next sequencing, uh, next generation sequencing is uh, to see any potential um, target therapy for the those uh, high-grade gaumas, for example, in recurrent or, or residual uh, gauma cases. So uh, will the oncologist try to use uh, some new potential target based on this uh, result. What I'm saying is, sequencing or stara, yeah. uh, sequencing or DNA or sequencing or stay, so they got the regular Yakun Tatska, the Koto Kikaratevas. Hi. Yeah, it, uh, thank you for uh, so it's uh, it's now the so under under research, so not not so actual uh, in the Actually, in the so uh, practical field. The, yes, yes. So, sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm ターゲットが絞れてないのでまだあのどれがその有益な遺伝子かなのかっていうのまではまだまだこれからあのデータを積み重ねていくような最中であるっていうことですねそう so can i translate that so please, please. professor otani is saying that uh, the sequence covers many many genes and uh, it is not yet clear which gene is actually responsible or recurrence or long-term survival. So there's a, still a confusion. It's a, in a research level. So we are not, you know, uh, we, we do not exactly know whether sequences is going to help in the individual patient or not. I see, I see. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And also thank you, Professor Peng, for the excellent <laughs> translation. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe another comment is from Dr. Thomas. Thomas, I say. Thomas, I say, please.
Thank you for the excellent presentation. In eloquent area, especially the speech area where you are operating, how much is the diffusion tractography is helpful for you intraoperatively? Thank you. Thank you for your good question. So in the speech area, we can, uh, so it's not, not so useful for the tractography. So, so it's very difficult for to detect the uh, speech speech area for uh, using the tractography. I think so. So just <clears throat> only just uh, awake surgery is can be can be useful for the uh, for the uh, language area. Okay. Okay. Mm. Thank you for the excellent presentation. It's, yeah, it's very very difficult for. Uh, there is also one question in the chat box. So uh, by Dr. Uh, Samir. So the question is how often do you do cross biopsy to minimize the extent of uh, resection? So I think the question is mainly about, so in what uh, cases do you consider biopsy instead of, uh, uh, instead of the a, um, major excision? Crush biopsy, which means the crush biopsy. I, I I think I think I think uh, he means uh, about the uh, 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 stereotactic biopsy instead of a stereotactic. major. Ah, ha, ha, yeah. No no no. I think no no no. Frozen no. section. Frozen section. No frozen. no. It's, it's ah. cross biopsy. He's stuck. I think Professor Otani is doing yeah, yeah. a frozen section in all cases, right? Yeah. You yeah, yeah. you are doing yeah. frozen section. But cross biopsy yeah. is you take a, if you do not have a frozen section in your hospital, yeah. then it's like a cytology. It's like kind of a cytology where you cross the tissue and do a HE staining. I see. And look at it. Uh -huh. And yeah. that can be done in any setting. This is, this is what uh, uh, Samir Acharya uh, is asking, I think, cross biopsy. Yeah. So I don't think he's doing that. He's doing frozen section. Yeah. And uh, yeah, also, yeah. yeah, we do cross biopsy in our institute because we don't have a frozen section. And um, if the uh, pathologist can confidently say this is very high grade glioma, then we tell her accordingly. Uh, but sometimes they cannot tell. Then in that case, we cannot, uh, it, it will not be very helpful. But most of the time, if you don't have a frozen section in your institute, then you can go and do uh, cross biopsy. So, so may I ask, uh, Professor Pan, usually how long it takes for the results uh, to uh, come back for the cross biopsy? Uh, it's, about, it's about 20 minutes. I see. So you just send the tissue and then they, you know, they just stain it uh, after crossing it and making it like a cy cytology. And then, you know, and uh, we had one of our residents who did um uh, uh thesis on this uh so you know it's, it's useful if you don't have a frozen section i see yeah thank you thank, thank you so much thank for you. The, also uh, for answering uh, this question yes thank you so professor uh raza would, would you like to wrap up the program. I think there is no question, and we are done with our presentation. Uh, we really enjoyed. We have in Anapurna, our you know we have about 16, 17 members who are listening to this program today. And uh, oh, band, who are they? Are they a rehabilitation uh, staff or a nurse, doctor? Who, who are the staff? The, the, the staffs are uh, everybody is a doctor here. Yeah. A doctor. I see. Nurses, uh, no, no nurse. Any nurse? No. We have one Hi. biomedical engineer who is very interested. Biomedical engineer, the rest is doctors. All residents. Can you raise your hand? Say something. Come on. Yes, please, please. Why it is very important. Very sorry. Resa is there, you know Resa. 
So they are all from Nepal or some other countries? Well, we have one from Germany. Oh. Lisa from Germany. Oh, Lisa, say something. Thank you. Great. Yes. So we came a larger, larger. <laughs> Thank hospital. you very much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So anybody is going to wrap up. Uh, I think with this, we end the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes. So, uh, Professor, yeah. yes, thank you so much yes. for uh, joining this uh, webinar. So, Professor Kato, do you have a final remark? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I thank you very much for Dr. Kim. So we uh, we haven't seen it for a long time, but uh, uh, I really understand that you became a very weak, a good uh, uh, epileptic neurosurgeon. I'm very proud of you. And also uh, uh, Dr. Kamal, uh, the, under the supervision of the Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much for a nice, uh, I think dynamic uh, DSA is very, very important to make a diagnosis. So you should continue the, your uh, great work. Thank you very much. And also the Otani Sensei, thank you very much. I, I thought he is uh, just uh, the benign style-based neurosurgeon, but now I understood that you are uh, also the glioma surgeon. And thank you very much. We learned a lot today. Arigatou uh, and also uh, Abida Shah, and also uh, Dr. Raja and Thomas, and also, of course, Basan Pant. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, today's MC. This is it. Then? Yes, uh, so thank you so much, uh, po uh, Professor Kato. So, uh, on behalf of the uh, Educational Committee of the ACNS, I would like to uh, thank you all for joining uh, this uh, webinar. So uh, uh, this webinar will also be broadcast in a, in a WeChat channel uh, by uh, Professor Xu Bin. So um, again, this is uh, to, tonight is a very uh, educational night with a very uh, fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, it's time to say bye-bye uh, to all of us and I hope to see you uh, next time. So uh, see you all and uh, good, bye -bye. good evening to everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> bye bye. bye, -bye. Nep ne Nepalese colleagues, bye bye. Okay. Bye, -bye. bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you so much for joining. Tanto <laughs> sensei, oyasumi nasai. Oyasumi nasai. Oyasumi nasai. Shishimasu. Oyasumi nasai. Otai sensei, arigatou gozaimashita. Arigatou gozaimashita.